Dear Lord, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for everything you've given us. Lord, I pray that you'll be with everybody as they go throughout the week and do everything to glorify you. Amen. Oops. Great job, guys. Well, good evening, everybody. How are y'all tonight? I just went into my news anchor voice there for a second. Sorry. So I learned something last night that I have been disrespecting people for, like, years accidentally. Did y'all know it was rude when somebody texts you to text them back the letter K? I had no idea until last night somebody told me, that's really rude to do that. I just thought I was being, you know quick about it. But I was told it's really rude when you do that. Um, I, went, I had like several, especially with younger people apparently, and I guess y'all are them. I had several 20-year-olds tell, tell me, oh yeah, when you worked at the station, I thought you were mad at me so many times when you texted me. I was just telling them that was K. It was fine. You know, that's what I thought I was doing. See, what y'all don't understand, some of these older people back here will get this. When I learned to text we had a different kind of phone than you have now. It looks something like this, if they'll bring it up here for a second. It looked like that. And I want you to look at the six. You had to hit that thing three times to get to the O. So you learn to be, um, you learn to be quick with the way. So you just text the one letter. The K is right there. It's just the second letter. You have to hit it twice. And so that's how I learned to text. But somebody told me last night that I was being rude all these years. It was not my intention to do that. So if I have ever texted you K, adult, teenager, anything, I'm, I'm really sorry. From now on, I'll write out the word. But um, I found that out last night. So I've learned my lesson. I've repented of my past K ways, and I'm going to do better from now on because I don't want to offend anybody with my texting. My point is this. What we believe will affect what we do. See, I believe the most important thing in texting was getting it out there, getting it back there quick, being efficient with my letters, when the truth is the most important thing in texting is not offending someone when you do it. You know? And so um, because I believed efficiency was the most important thing, I texted back one letter, answers, and I thought that was great. But now I understand that it's not the most important thing, so it's going to affect me. Now I'm going to text back, okay, that sounds great. Love you. Um, thank you for texting me. This has been a wonderful conversation that we've had every single time now. Um, but... Um, the point is, now that I understand, I'm going to change the way I act. And see, the same is true with your faith. What you believe about God will affect the way you live. Believe right things about God, and it's going to, it's going to lead to right living toward God. Believe wrong things about God, and it's going to lead to wrong living with God. And so tonight, as we continue our study through the book of Titus, we're going to see exactly that. So, so Paul ties right belief with right living. If you understand the right truths about God, specifically if you understand the gospel, you understand um, what, what salvation is and what it does, then it will change the way you live. And so that's what we're going to see in just a few verses that we're going to look at tonight. Remember, we're kind of tying a bow on all of this series by talking about um, where this ministry needs to go as we look for a new student pastor, what a new student pastor needs to be like, the kind of things he needs to do. So we've talked about that over the last several weeks. And so tonight we're going to continue thinking and talking about that as we look at about five verses in Titus chapter 2. So this is what Paul says to Titus, beginning in verse 11 of chapter 2. He says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Let's pray over God's word this evening. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for how good it is. Thank you for what it shows us about who you are, about what you've done, about what you're doing right now, and what you're going to do, Lord. And thank you for what it tells us about what we should do in response to what you've done and what you're doing, Lord. I pray tonight as we look into your word that you'll use it to change us. Help us to see what you've done for us, see what you're going to do for us, and help that to change the way we live right now, Lord. Thank you for what you're going to do, and I ask you to do it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So, so remember where we are as we've studied through the book of Titus over the last several weeks. The book is written by the Apostle Paul to his young protege named Titus. Um, Paul and Titus went to the island of Crete, and they shared the gospel with the people there for the first time, and many of them were saved through hearing the gospel. Paul then goes on to his next stop on his missionary journey. He leaves Titus behind in Crete, and it's Titus' job to, to set up the churches in Crete. So a lot of people have been saved, but there are no churches in place now. So Titus' job is to stick around, to stay behind, and to get the churches set up. And so what we see in Titus in this letter, Paul has written this letter to him um, after he left to say, these are the things that you need to be doing. This is the kind of person I want you to be. These are the things that you need to be doing to make sure the churches are in order. So he wrote him those letters. We've seen over the last several weeks some of the things that he wrote about. He talked about qualifications to be a pastor, and we talked about what that meant for our new student pastor. He's talked about... Um, how we have to combat lies that the culture tells us and that our communities tell us and how our pastor can help us with that. Um, we've talked about and we've seen the standard that ought to be set with students and adults and how adults are to be mentoring students and students are to be listening to the adults and um, the pastor sets that example for that. And tonight I want you to notice um, in the last verse that we just read, look at verse 15 if you have your Bible, um, and if you don't, bring your Bible next week. It'll be helpful in this, okay? Um, verse 15... And if you don't have a Bible, we can get you one. Okay, all right, now, verse 15. Notice what, what um, Paul tells Titus to do. He says, Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority, and let no one disregard you. In other words, the stuff we're going to study tonight is of highest importance. It's extremely important that this be the heart, at the heart of all preaching and teaching and Bible study. These things are so important that Paul says, These are the things... That ought to be the center of your ministry, the focus of your ministry. Paul's instruction here to Titus is the very things we're going to study, they're so important, they ought to be the center of our teaching, they ought to be the center of all teaching here at the church, they ought to be the center of this ministry, and when your new student pastor comes in, they'll be the center of what he tells you and teaches you and preaches to you as he, as he comes in and is a part of this ministry. So this little paragraph that we just read, beginning in verse 11 and going down through verse 14, just chock full of truths, and pointers about God's grace, about salvation, about what it means to be a Christian, and about what the gospel ought to do for us and to us and, and in us and how we ought to live. So this evening I want you to see three truths about God's grace from this text, okay? So the first truth I want you to see is who God's grace is for. Watch how this begins. It begins by, by connecting what we studied last week to what we just read. So look at that first word in this passage that we read in verse 11. That first word is for, for the grace of God. So that for is to connect back to what we're talking about before. All right. You see a for in Scripture, you need to ask, what's it there for? Okay. Um, that for is there to connect us back. And so remember, Paul was talking about the lifestyle that adults ought to live and how they ought to be mentoring um, younger people and how younger people ought to be listening to that teaching and mentoring. And then he talks about what the pastor ought to do, how they set the example um, and what that ought to look like. And so the connecting word there for, for simply means because of what I just said, this is what I'm saying now. All right? So because of what I said about what you ought to be doing as a pastor, what you ought to be doing in your churches and in your ministry, I'm going to say this now. So the reason this is so important, what we're about to study, the reason it's so serious is because eternity is at stake. Notice what he said um, in these verses that come. He's talked about grace, and he's talked about salvation, and he's talking about the return of Jesus. And he's saying, the reason that I need you to live a godly life, the reason I need you to have this particular lifestyle is because eternity is at stake, and the message that you're taking to the world is at stake. If, if you don't look different from the world around you, they have no reason to listen to what you have to say. Why would, you, why would I want to hear what you have to say? It's not making any difference in your lives. And so that's what he's saying. I'm, I'm writing you this so you will understand how important this is. We have a message that is so important that we cannot let the way we are living get in the way of someone hearing it. And so here's the message. The message we're charged with taking to the world, this is the center of the gospel, the message they need to hear first, that you need to hear first, that you need to accept, and once you've accepted it, you need to live it out, and you need to start telling everyone else about it. The message is simple. The grace of God has appeared. Y'all need to understand... What good news this is. 
that the grace of God has appeared. So he's saying that God has shown his grace in an amazing and perfect way by sending his son Jesus to the earth. He's saying that Jesus came, he lived a perfect life, he died for the sins of the world, he died for your sins, and that is the definition of grace. Grace is getting something that you do not deserve. And can I be really clear with all of you tonight? You don't deserve grace, all right? You don't deserve the forgiveness that Jesus offers. None of us deserves the forgiveness Jesus offered. I don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. What we deserve is death. Every single person in this room deserves to die and spend eternity in hell. The Bible says that is the fate of every single person. The wages of sin is death. That a single sin, one little thing, got mad at my mom today. That sin makes you deserve death makes you deserve hell. That's what the gospel tells us, okay? It's because we're st one day you're going to stand before a holy, perfect God, and any imperfection is going to be an offense to him. Have you ever heard the story about the princess and the pea? Do you all know that story? So remember what happened? They stacked up a bunch of mattresses, and they put a little pea under the bottom mattress, and what did she do? She couldn't sleep all night. Why was that? She was used to sleeping in perfect comfort all the time. So it, all it took was just one little pea to mess up the whole thing. God, and the reason was because she was, a, she was a princess. She was used to sleeping in perfection all the time. God is in the same way, is like that in some way, in that he is perfect. And all it takes is the smallest, most minor perfection to offend him. That's how holy he is. And so because of that, the smallest sin is enough for you to deserve death. This one little sin in comparison to a big holy God is not little at all to him. It's of utmost seriousness, and God would be right in sending every one of us to hell for committing one single sin. But instead, he did something else. He could have just wiped his hands clean of us. Instead, he did something else. He sent his son for us. Okay, This is what Paul means when he says, the grace of God has appeared. Jesus came, and Jesus never sinned. He was perfect. He never sinned once. Lived for 33 years, and not one single time did he sin. He did not deserve death, but he got death anyway. He died in one of the most horrific ways possible, on the cross. The reason he, he died was not because he deserved it. It was because he was taking the punishment for us. And so when, when the Bible talks about the grace of God appearing, this is what it means. You deserve death for one sin. How many of y'all have only committed one sin? Me either, okay? So if you deserve sin for death for one sin, how much do you deserve for all the sins you've actually committed? See, all of us deserve death in hell, but what God has done is sent his son to take it for us instead. He took the death that we deserved, and this is why Paul says the grace of God has appeared. And notice what he says about the grace of God appearing. Look down back at that verse 11. He says, The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Jesus has paid the price for your sins in full. All you have to do is accept that, believe it, trust it, and you receive forgiveness of sins, but not just you. He says he has appeared, bringing salvation for for all people, every single person everywhere has the opportunity for this salvation. There is no one who is beyond this. So though the smallest sin means you deserve death and hell, the greatest sin couldn't keep you out of God's salvation if you want it. So think about the worst thing you've ever done. For some of you, that may not be that big a deal, and for some of you, it may be a really big deal. Think of the worst thing you've ever done. If you did that from now till the next 10 years without stopping, you would still not be beyond God's grace because God's grace is huge, and that salvation is for everyone. That means it's for everyone no matter what their sin. It means it's for everyone no matter where they are. That's why it's so important that we take the gospel all over the world, because everyone, though everyone deserves death, everyone needs to hear this message, because salvation is available for everyone. It's available for you. It's available for everyone you know. It's available for everyone that you don't know. It's available for everyone who will ever live. This is the promise of salvation. This is why God's grace is so amazing, and this is why we sing the song Amazing Grace, because it is incredible. This is why Paul says God's grace has appeared to us. And notice, 
Because God's grace has appeared to us, because it offers salvation for all of us, we must take this message to the world. This is why it is so important that you share your faith with someone. Think about what happens when you um, try some new food, you go to a new restaurant, and you love it. Like it's the best food you've ever eaten. Or you get a new app on your phone, and it's like this cool game that you just, you just think is amazing. You find a new game that you want to play. Um, something like a, you find a new TV show that you're watching, you just think it's great. What is the first thing you do? You th- you tell everybody you know, right? You've got to get this. It is awesome. You've got to get it. The same thing is true for us. God's grace is so amazing that he calls us to tell everyone about it because everyone has got to get this. The only reason you wouldn't do that is if you were embarrassed by it. If you were you know, 17 years old and watching some show on PBS Kids that you really like, but you don't want anybody else to know that you like it, okay? That's the only reason you wouldn't do it. So the reason you wouldn't tell anybody about Jesus is because are you embarrassed of him? This is amazing grace that he's given. And he calls us to tell the world about it. He calls us to tell people about it because it is such amazing grace. So that's the first truth I want you to see, um, who God's grace is for. So who's God's grace for? Everybody, no matter what their sin, no matter where they are. Now I want you to see what God's grace produces. Notice what Paul says about the grace of God and and what it's done now that it's appeared. It's brought salvation for all people, and it's done something. Look back. In verse 12, Paul says that it trains us. God's grace trains us. God's salvation trains us. What does it train us to do? You see, a negative thing, so something God's salvation trains us not to do, and then something else that God's salvation trains us to do. Paul says salvation um, that has been offered to us trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passion. So if you want to understand what, that, what, what does that mean, godlessness and, and worldly passions, what does it need, mean to renounce that? It means to give it up, to get away from it, to run from it, to, to not want to live like that. So what does he mean by, by ungodliness and, and worldly passions? Well, it's the stuff we've been talking about for the first chapter and a half of this book, those kinds of things that Paul has condemned throughout this letter so far. So he says, salvation trains us not to be arrogant or quick-tempered or drunk or violent or greedy, as you see in chapter 1. It trains us not to be people who talk about other people as you see in chapter 2. Paul is saying that when we get saved, this salvation teaches us the way we're supposed to live. And part of living right is avoiding things that we're supposed to avoid. So guys, there's some some things in your school and in your neighborhood and in your home maybe even that you need to run from. You need to avoid it at all costs. When you get around around people who tempt you to talk about other people, and I know y'all all have friends like that, You might be friends like that. When you get around those kind of people, you need to run from it. When you get around people who are drinking or doing drugs, you need to run from it. When you get around people who are in ungodly relationships and tempt you to be in ungodly relationships, you need to run from it. He says, this is what it means to renounce worldliness and ungodlessness. We renounce that kind of stuff. But, but, so saved people aren't perfect people, but part of being saved is learning to get away from the things that you ought not be around. If your heart has been changed by Jesus, you ought to have some new desires, and that ought to cause you to want to get away from those old temptations. You ought to run from them. Okay? Run from them. The Puritan John Owen said, Be killing sin, or sin will be killing you. And that's the truth. We should run from them. And then Paul says, not only should we run from some things, we should run to some things, okay? So Paul's saying that salvation causes us to run to those things. When I first got saved, I thought if I just take, if I just stop doing a couple of sins that were, that, that were, I I knew were wrong, if I just stopped doing those things, then I'd be good. I'd be a perfect Christian. I'd never have to change anything else for the rest of my life. That's not how it works, okay? It's more than just stopping doing some things. It's starting to do some things. That's why Paul says that not only salvation causes us to to run from those bad things, he says it causes us to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. In other words, you ought to try to be living like Jesus. You ought to want to look like Jesus, not just in sin avoidance, but in pursuing good things. You should want to love and show grace and show mercy like Jesus. You should want to serve other people like Jesus. He makes that even more clear in verse 14 when he says that Jesus gave himself. He died to redeem us from lawlessness and to purify people who were zealous for good works. In other words, if you are saved, it 
ought to lead to you doing good things. He saved you so you can become more like him and, and live like him, more than just avoiding bad stuff, to want passionately to do good things in your life. You've been called to be like Jesus, to serve and love like him. Now, if you've ever tried this, how many of you have, could say, and you don't have to raise your hands, don't you think about this, have you ever really tried really hard to be good? How long did that last for you? Ten minutes. Thank you for your honesty. I would, go, I would have guessed five, but you did, you're doing good twice as much as I would have guessed. The problem is that living the Christian life is impossible. And if you try to do it for very long, you probably have realized that. Today I'm going to be good. You, you are, you are going to hear this message tonight and you're going to say, Yes, I'm going to walk out here and I'm going I'm to act right from here on out. I'm going to obey my parents. I'm going to get away from those people who I shouldn't be around. I'm going to start loving people. And, and when my sister annoys me, I'm not going to want to smack her. I, I'm not going to do any of those things. I'm going to avoid that bad stuff, and I'm going to pursue good stuff. And you're going to go out there, and then you're going to run into your sister or your brother. And suddenly, these great ideas that you had about acting right come smack with reality. And you, fi you find out that, oh, yeah, this is hard. I can't do this. Here's the problem. Very often we've convinced ourselves that, that Jesus saves us, that the grace of God gives us salvation, and once we are saved, it's our job to start acting right. So we ball up our fists, and we grit our teeth, and I'm going to do it right this time. Ugh! And we try what I call white-knuckle Christianity. You just, I'm going to get right this time. And it lasts five minutes. And you fail. Because the truth is that you cannot do this on your own. You can't do this yourself. And this is why Paul connects the appearing of the grace of God, offering salvation to all people, to the fact that it trains us to live godly lives. In other words, the fact that you have been saved, the fact that you have the Holy Spirit inside you, is the thing that will give you the ability to live for God. See, um, very often what we think of when we think about the gospel, when we think about getting saved, we think of the gospel as like a diving board. And I'm going to jump into the pool of Christianity. Okay? The gospel is the pool. So we live in the pool, we live in the gospel, and that's what helps us to live the Christian life. So by reminding myself of what Jesus has done for me, think about the amazing grace that I talked about just a couple of minutes ago, how amazing it is that I've been rescued from hell, that I've been given forgiveness of sin, that I've been promised eternal life. When you preach that to yourself, when you constantly tell yourself, this is what Jesus has done for me, this is how good he has been for me. This is how his grace has appeared to me. When you constantly tell yourself that, what you find is it starts changing you from the inside out. And you go from somebody who, no matter how much teeth gritting and fist bawling they do, they can't obey, to someone who finds it increasingly more easy to obey. Because now you're not trying to do this on your own. You're doing it through the power of the Holy Spirit by reminding yourself of what Jesus has done for you. So that's what the gospel produces. That's what God's grace produces in us. It produces in us the ability to live for him. Right? That's the second truth I want you to see. Now I want you to see the final truth, and that's how God's grace gives us hope. How many of you are excited about the return of Jesus? Like you want him to come back right now. It's okay, okay. Like I know you have to say that, but some of y'all are thinking, I want to finish high school can we get done with the football season first? Um, I'd like to meet a girl and at least go on one date before Jesus comes back. Um, can, we, can we wait till you know, this season of American Idol is over and I can find out who wins before I, before I do that? Like You've got some things you want to do. You're like, I'm a kid. I want to live some life before Jesus comes back. That's how I felt when I was a teenager. I was like, I'd like to get married, have some kids, see how this whole, I'd like to have a job. Um, the idea of Jesus coming back did not excite me when I was your age. I'll just be honest with you, okay? But notice what Paul says here. He says something different here. It's really important for you to see tonight. He says the return of Jesus, what he calls the appearing of the glory of our God and Savior. If you look down at verse 14, or verse 13, he says, I'm waiting for our blessed hope. 
In other words, Paul is saying that the return of Jesus ought to fill us with hope. That means the return of Jesus is not something of, for us to be afraid of. It's not something for us to dread. It's not something for us to want to put on delay until we can accomplish some things in our lives. The return of Jesus ought to be the reason that we wake up in the morning. It ought to be the thing that gives us hope. Here's why Paul is saying this. This is what the promise of Jesus is all about. The promise of Jesus returning is not that you're going to miss out on stuff when he comes back. The promise of Jesus returning is that you're going to get things that you could have never imagined when he returns. See, the promise is that Jesus is going to one day return to the earth, and when he does, he's going to fix everything. How many of you recognize when you look around the world that something is messed up? Watch the news. You know something is messed up. Something is broken about this world. There are good things about it. You have things that you love about your life, I'm sure, but you also recognize there's something that just isn't right. Things are not the way they're supposed to be. It's because of the sin that we talked about earlier. Because things have been broken, they're messed up. Um, That's the reason that we have hurt and pain and sickness. It's the reason that you get injuries when you play sports. It's the reason that we have tornadoes and earthquakes. It's the reason that we have cancer and death. Because sin has messed everything up. But the promise of the return of Jesus, what Paul calls here our blessed hope, is that one day he's going to come back and he's going to fix everything when he comes back. He's going to come back, and he's going to fix everything finally and forever. So you probably can think of about a lot of good things that you like about the world, okay? And they're inherently good things. You have relationships. You have people you love. You have things about this world that you enjoy. You like nature. You love playing sports or hunting and fishing. You love love your friends or your family. You have hobbies that you like. Um, And there are probably some things that you like, that, that probably aren't so good, a TV show that you shouldn't be watching, or a relationship that you shouldn't be having, some things that you know don't honor God. And then you've got some things that you know are wrong. You don't like them. You wish they were gone. They, they mess up. You've got, you've got problems with your family. There are problems at home, problems with um, friends, issues at school. Um, math tests are because of sin. Did y'all know that? There will be no math test when Jesus returns, so you won't have to worry about that, okay? Uh, uh, now y'all want to come back, want him to come, right? Okay, so, so like those kind of problems, all that stuff will be gone when Jesus returns. The promise of the return of Jesus is that all the things that you love about this world that are inherently good, that are good, are going to stay. You're not going to miss out on anything when Jesus returns. He's going to fix all the bad stuff. The things that shouldn't be here are going to be gone. The things that should be here are going to stay. And the promise of Jesus' return is that one day we get to live in a world where everything is good and nothing is bad. Isn't that good news? Yeah, where everything is good, everything is right, your relationships are right. There are no problems at school where, where you never get tired, you never hurt, you never get sick, you don't have any problems, nobody ever messes with you. Everyone and everything about it is good. That's the promise, and that's why Paul calls it a blessed hope. Pain is gone, tornadoes and hurricanes are going to be gone, sin is going to be gone, and all that's going to remain is going to be the good. Everything that sin messed up, Jesus is going to fix. And those who follow him will remain along with all the good things about the world. You don't want to miss out on this. That's the point that he's making, and that's why Paul can call it our our blessed hope. And so what he is saying is, watch the flow of thought for this passage. So he begins with saying that Jesus um, has given us grace and salvation to everyone. That kind of salvation helps us to live godly lives. And the reason we want to live godly lives is because one day Jesus is going to come back and he's going to fix everything. And we live with that hope and it, and it pushes us forward. It keeps us going. No matter how hard things are today, we say, yeah, today was tough, but Jesus is coming back. And one day he's going to fix it. Yeah, tomorrow may be tough. But one day Jesus is coming back, and he's going to fix it. And that becomes our blessed hope, and it gives us the ability to live right now. If you will live with the expectation that Jesus is going to return one day, it will change everything about the way you live right now. It will change. It will, it will, the hurt will still hurt. 
The problems will still be problems. The pain will still be pain. But you will go through it with the knowledge that one day Jesus is going to fix this. No matter how bad it is now, one day Jesus is going to fix this. How many Are, are there any runners in here? I know there's a few runners in here. I told you all Sunday if you were here how much I hate running. It's terrible. But I do it with the expectation that I'm going to be finished at some point. All right? And so what we're doing as Christians is we're like runners pushing toward the finish line. And when we get there, the finish line, Jesus is there, and everything is going to be okay. And that's the promise. This is the, this, what Paul does in these few verses is encapsulates the truths that we ought to live around. God has given us glorious, magnificent grace. That grace will help us to live for him now as we wait for him later to come back. And that ought to give us everything we need to do to live right now. So we're going to go into a time of invitation now. Our, our, our singer's going to come in just a second here. Miss Brandy's going to come, and she's going to lead us in a prayer for our next student pastor. And I want you to think about a few things as we sing. Um, some of you need to, need to come down here to this altar, and you need to say, Lord, um, I'm struggling to live for you right now. Will you give me the strength to do what you would have me to do? Okay? Some of you just need to get around this altar and pray that. Um, some of you... Um, just need to come down here, get down to the altar, and pray for our next student pastor. He's coming one day. He's going to be here before Jesus gets back, hopefully. Okay? He's going to be here, and we want to be prepared for him when he gets here. Okay? And then some of you, there's somebody in here, the reason you can't live the Christian life is because you're not a Christian. You don't have the Holy Spirit inside you. You've not been saved by him. You've not been forgiven by him. You've not been given that grace. You've not accepted that salvation that he offers for all of us. So when we start singing in just a moment, if God's calling you to something tonight, will you respond? Will you not wait another day? You've waited long enough. Tonight is the night that you can turn to him, receive what he has to offer for you, and have the eternal life that he, he, he's willing to give each and every one of us. So Ms. Brandy's going to pray, and then y'all come up here and sing, and if God's calling you to something, you do that. Brandy? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this blessing. I thank you for everything that you've given us and all that you've done for us, dear Lord. I ask that you'll please just clear our minds and allow us to uh, think about what Brother Wade talked about today. Dear Lord, we all struggle with sin. We all struggle with um, trials and things that we face. And dear Lord, I ask that you'll please convict us as those. Please show us what, what we need to change in our lives. Please show us how we can be different and how we can stand out for you. Dear Lord, and I ask that you'll please just help us to, to be willing to come down to the altar, dear Lord, and, and lay those at your feet. Lord, I ask that you please just help us walk away, dear Lord, knowing that you're here for us and that you will always be there for us and that we will have hope in seeing you again one day. And I thank you for all your blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.